everyone, uh, welcome to the MSC podcast. This is episode four, and today I am joined by Max Harmon. Uh, Max is the head of the MSC Sports Injury Clinic. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the quarantine and the effects that it's going to have on uh, field athletes. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, a lot about specifically rugby players, but this will carry over to uh, all kind of field athletes. Um, so. Uh, Max uh, has been uh, with us since the uh, the early days of opening MSC, and as I said, uh, opened uh, opened up our sports injury clinic and uh, continues to run that. Uh, Max has also got background uh, as the head of strength conditioning at Coventry Rugby Club, uh, where in his time in charge, he helped the club uh, get promotion from National One into the Championship. He's also got experience working uh, with Leicester Tigers and Ealing Trailfinders as well. So uh, Max has a wealth of experience in regards to uh, training, strength conditioning uh, for, for rugby players. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him on board. Um, as for myself, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mark. I'm the owner of MSC Performance. And um, I'm a rugby player myself uh, at semi-professional mm -hmm. level, uh, currently playing for Bourneville. Uh, I've just got promotion into the national leagues and I've got a wealth of experience working with uh, the armed combined services and the armed forces uh, rugby teams uh, heading up their strength conditioning as well uh, before uh, setting up MSC performance. So uh, today we're just going to have uh, as I say, a little chat about um, the effects of the lockdown and how as athletes and rugby players we can um, we can try and overcome uh, these these obstacles and come out uh, in the best shape as uh, possible. So, uh, Max, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so, no, thanks for having me. What uh, What do you think the uh, What's your kind of overview on uh, the effects of, uh, of, of the whole thing? It's It's going to be a really weird, like quite unique situation where I think like it would be even more so at the top level, but then like it's going to go all the way down to kind of semi pro and grassroots. So, I know at the top level now they're talking about trying to start uh, or, or sort of get the final like eight nine games of the season in over the course of like a six week period um so that in particular you're going to have players who are going to come back from lockdown they're going to be able to start training in small groups so they're going to have loads of games to prepare for in a very short space of time so i have like eight or nine games in six weeks they're going to have next to no pre-season to to prepare for it in and they're going to have coaches that are real trigger happy on trying to get everyone back into in, into shape and into into a team again. So at the top level, it's going to be even worse, I think, because you know you've got you have got a load of players going from almost no team training to a really really condensed competitive structure um so they're going to be going from zero to 100 really really fast um i don't think it's going to be as bad at the lower levels and at the kind of community level but even so you're going to have guys that are probably going to have been doing loads of suboptimal training um coming back into a really really short pre-season um going straight into competitive fixtures after that um and we, i just think on the whole we're just going to see the, the physical quality of most players to, to have dropped off significantly um, and the injury risk across the board for like soft tissue injuries, for non-contact injuries, it's just going to be sky high if this isn't all managed properly. Um, so that's going to be the kind of general overview. And, and, and there's there's a million and one reasons behind that, which I'm sure we'll go into. But um, yeah, it's going to be a really weird situation, I think. And, with, and the full effects are, are yet to be seen and they won't be seen, I don't think, until kind of September time. Fantastic, yeah. So um, as, a, as, a, as a player right now so obviously you know we'd normally be coming towards the end of the season around uh, around now um you know what just 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 for the kind of average player what do you what do you think are the um importance um and, and benefits of that player sort of maintaining strength maintaining speed and power um you know, during during this lockdown, as opposed to you know, kind of hanging around and waiting. So, the, the the biggest thing is, and I think going back to what we we're talking about before, what this likely massive ramp up of training and playing that we're going to see when people come out of lockdown, that in itself is is a huge predictor of injuries. So, if you if you suddenly start building up workload very quickly, the rate at which you 
build up your workload is is really important if you do it in a sensible way and you kind of you manage your training volume and you manage your lifting volume and you're on feet volume and, and you progress that by small amounts week on week you're probably going to be okay uh, but that's not what's going to happen again like i think you're going to have technical coaches that come in and say right i've got two weeks to get everyone match fit let's hammer them and everyone's going to blow up in the first week so the the stronger you are the the more you've trained in this lockdown period and the, the right kind of training you know considered um the more you've trained and the more you've maintained your physical quality the more of a steep increase in volume your body's going to be able to tolerate yeah um you know volume prescription is still going to be huge but if you've been doing good quality hamstring work groin work calf and ankle work um you know they're, they're going to be the three three big areas i think you're going to see people really flaring up and really picking up injuries as long as like patella tendons achilles tendons if you've done the right kind of work you're going to kind of mitigate a lot of that risk um to, to the best of your ability um i think you so i think yeah sorry i was just going to jump in i mean yeah i think that's going to be the key is now you know as soon as we as soon as we're allowed back coaches are going to be very very excited to try and get players as as fit as, uh, as quickly as possible without laying the appropriate foundation so i think it's really important mm -hmm. players take on responsibility now within themselves to prepare them uh, themselves as as best as possible for that you know we all know what pre-seasons you know like at the yeah. times, you know you go back in your first session you know you do you, you know you're doing, doing doing lengths and you know getting an absolute beasting so uh yeah i think you know this is this is opportunity isn't it like you say i think you know massive importance on the injury prevention side of things and just uh preparing that you know building that robustness in time for when you when you go back where it is going to be hectic and it is going to be chaos exactly that and and i think the teams that will do best this season are not necessarily the the biggest strongest fittest fastest teams it is and and to be honest this is this is as much as as a strength and conditioning coach you want to be able to say that you know i've really helped this team i'm 50 percent of the success because my players are the fittest fastest and strongest realistically the team that has the best players more often than not wins um yeah. and that's simple as that like um even if you're fat and unfit if you're in the right place all the time and you don't have to run as far as someone else because you know where you need to be yeah, you're actually good. like i say you kind of you can't yeah if you're good enough play you, you you're in the right place at the right time anyway but um the teams that are going to do really really well in the next season whether it starts in august september october whatever it might be are just the teams that are going to keep the best players fit yeah. and not and, and stop them from getting injured and, and that's a big 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 thing but and another thing that and i think that that conversation that we just had there that's been kind of the the consensus among you know sports science and strength and conditioning field from what i've seen on social media a lot over the last few weeks but the, another big thing i think is a spec and again this is more kind of especially at the top level and it becomes less and less apparent as you go further and further down the leagues you know at the top level realistically every so let's say every premier League, every championship club they've they will all run a variation on a relatively similar program like they're all doing upper body lower body strength training they're all doing power work later on in the week they're all doing the high levels of conditioning they're using what bikes they're using rowers etc etc like everyone in the top level is kind of is is in good condition and has a low injury risk and that isn't what wins games but you have to have that certain level of physical quality just to compete if you see what i mean so like there's a minimum level you have to be at to compete but everyone's at that level it doesn't win games it doesn't lose games it's just you have to be there to compete it's the same with things like the line out like every team in the premiership now has give or take a 90 percent line out success rate but that yeah. line out doesn't win games but you can be certain if your line out success rate is 50 percent, it can lose a game um but i think we're in a, a unique position now especially as you go further down the leagues that actually like loads of teams are going to come back after this lockdown and they're not going to be at that level. They're not going to be at the level that is expected in the league that they're in. So if you've got one team come in and they've just done as, as much as they need to to maintain the shape they're in, they're actually for once going to have a really, really big advantage over the rest of the league. And that's quite a unique position because we don't normally have that. You know, people are normally, even if you're, you know, the weekend warrior and you, you train once a week and you play once a week, 
if you're someone that is, you know, you're into your rugby, you're into your sport, generally speaking, those guys are probably in the gym anyway. Sure. Like, year round. Um, so, so, so yeah. it's, a, it's a, you know, arguably a bigger opportunity than ever, really, isn't it, from a strength conditioning point of view? You know, to 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 to, to get those um, those advantages over the over the opposition. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Because normally it's just everyone does the work and it cancels each other out. But at the moment, people might be doing work. People might have jumped on some other programs. People might be doing nothing. People might be doing something completely different every day. So if you can maintain some sort of structure and make sure that 90% of the training you're doing is still really effective, uniquely you're going to have quite a good competitive advantage because not only is that going to keep your your output high, it's going to keep you fit, it's going to keep you strong, it's going to improve your ability and contact. But more often than not, that kind of work is also what keeps you robust and resilient and prevents injuries. Yeah, yeah. So you know, with that in mind, Max, um, obviously – you know, a lot of a lot of people will be watching this now and thinking, right, okay, yeah, it's good. You know, it's important that I do something. It's important that I keep strong, keep fit in terms of injury prevention, in terms of you know coming back in as good a condition as possible. Uh, what those people might be asking now is, you know, what should I be doing? You know, if I haven't got any equipment, um, you know, what what should I be what should I be focus on? You know, we 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 know having having both worked with a lot of rugby players, there there'll still be rugby players a good level going in. Even when the gym's open and hitting, you know, three sets of ten, you know, doing chest on Monday, back yeah. on, you know, and, and whatever. Um, so, you know, just in terms of what qualities people should be looking to to train and and, and how to do that with uh, a lack of equipment. So, um, again, like I think the when you look at a different qualities of fitness when you look at like your aerobic endurance when you look at your maximum strength when you look at your maximum speed like all of these different qualities kind of fall off at different rates yeah. um you know like when you look at something like max strength that actually ha- even without lifting heavy weights it actually kind of hangs around for a while you know if, if you were to not go in the gym for two weeks the chances are you're probably going to go unless you're someone who, like you know like a, a high level power lifter who you know trains deadlift to within an inch of his life year round 10 years on the bounce yeah. um you could almost not go in the gym for two weeks walk straight back in and pull your one rep max most days of the week if you just had two weeks off like your max strength isn't going to disappear overnight yeah. um so we don't necessarily need to be training that you know if you haven't got a barbell and you haven't got 200 kilos worth of plates there's actually still loads of stuff that you can be doing to maintain all the other qualities around performance, like, you know, your maximal strength, your power output, um, you know, your aerobic capacity, your, your kind of repeat sprint ability. Like there's, there's all these different things that you can be doing. And I think people think as soon as the gym is shut, they thought oh, I'm going to lose everything. But like max strength is, is just one kind of facet of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so if we can use other modalities, you know, the, sprinting and jumping are going to be two of the biggest things that we can do um, during this period to not only kind of maintain muscle mass, but to really maintain, you know, maximal speed, maximal power output, which are qualities that, that drop off pretty quickly. Um, you know, we should uh, year round anyway, we should be sprinting every kind of five to seven days as a matter of course. Um, and even more so now it becomes more important if we can't get a big, heavy, like neural stimulus from heavy weights, we've got to be getting it from sprinting and jumping. Um, that kind of naturally, I think, pairs quite nicely with if you are going to be doing the max strength work. Um, like I think we've done loads of content through the MSC channels and through my own channels and with online clients and whatnot on like big, heavy isometric work against fixed um against fixed resistance like a towel like a door frame that kind of thing um so you know doing big heavy isometrics on a towel and then going straight into jumps and sprints these are really really powerful tools and they're they're going to be um a really really nice um alternative to getting under a barbell you know obviously a barbell is a really really useful tool and we shouldn't forget that but that that's just one kind of modality where we can really maintain some of those big qualities pretty well yeah Absolutely. I mean, in terms of the isometric uh, isometric work, a lot of people will be sort of asking what, you know, what kind of um, what are the benefits of isometric training and, and what kind of drills they, they could do. Obviously, we've got, you know, we've got a lot of videos out as well. Um, do you want to just expand on that for, for the viewers? In, in yeah. Life? So the, 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 they're really, first and foremost, from a practicality perspective, they're really, really easy to set up. But um, if we kind of split 
most training tools, most training tools, whether you're talking about resistance training or whether you're talking about jumping or plyometrics or whatever it might be, most training tools, the the, the adaptations that occur after the, after using them, you know, the, the change that happen in your body can kind of loosely fall under two categories. And one is like changes to on a neural level. Um, so, you know, the how your body is able to kind of switch muscles on and off how your body is able to synchronize movement between joints, how your body is able to synchronize movement uh, contraction in one muscle group is, is improved um, from strength training and jumps and throws and all this. And the other side of things is like the mechanical changes that we see. So like actual changes to the size of muscles, actual changes to the tissue in tendon. So everything's split into kind of neural and mechanical. And, and a lot of the time, you know, like heavy strength training, you'll, you'll get adaptations occurring in both of those. So we know that heavy weights can still help you grow bigger muscles, but at the same time, you, you can also do heavy weights and get stronger without getting bigger. So it kind of, it, it, it affects both of those. Isometrics are really nice in that um, we can work really, really, really hard for four or five seconds against a fixed resistance. And we're getting a huge neural stimulus. You know, it's something that, um, you know we, we can work really really hard we can get this massive neural stimulus and that can then help us to jump it over a short period of time like it can help us to jump throw a, a jump jump further or jump higher or sprint faster um so so we're getting a big neural stimulus which we're, we're kind of missing out on from not having a barbell sometimes yeah um and then the other side of it is actually if we push a little bit with less um intensity and we hold the contraction for maybe like 30 40 50 seconds we're getting really really positive changes around connective tissue and around tendons and um, that is going to go a long way to to protecting us from injury um so again like most guys will know especially you know guys that jump in the line out or um backs that are going to be doing a high volume of sprinting they'd have known from pre-season you know you get these hard pitches you might be running around in trainers doing conditioning in trainers and and um you know like seven aside or condition games in pre-season they know it's a few weeks and they start getting pain in, in their patella tendon they start getting achilles tendon problems they start getting pain in their groin um and these are all kind of like tendinopathies these are all kind of overuse injuries so if we can really protect these areas by doing these long low intensity isometrics we're actually doing a lot of work to, to really protect ourselves from those things because they're going to be the big things that are going to have people dropping like flies when we come back after the lockdown. Um, so so they, they, they give us everything in terms of, you know, neural changes and um, mechanical changes in tendons. If we keep doing those, like so we're effectively, we're using all the muscle mass we have, so it's going to help prevent muscle wastage from not lifting heavy weights. Um, but the, the other thing, and I think uh, this is something that isn't talked about so much um, outside of the top level, or if you don't have a strength and conditioning coach, but um, to get the most out of your training, we want to avoid kind of every day being the same. We want to avoid every day being kind of like moderate intensity. Um, so if you can organize training into days that are really, really high level and really hard, um, and then follow it with a day that's kind of low intensity, low effort, and a little bit easier, that gives the body the best stimulus and it gives it the best recovery. If everything's kind of in the middle, you're never really working hard enough to get a big adaptation and you're never really resting enough to get a lot of recovery. So you just end up getting more and more fatigued and kind of dropping off a cliff over time. So with those isometrics as they are, um, and again, using other tools like sort of the, the sprints and jumps and plyometrics and throws, um, we can use the really, really hard, really intense stuff with the sprints and throws to get these big high peaks in intensity and really, really give us ourselves a big stimulus. And then on the off days, it's really, really easy to adjust that intensity and give ourselves a nice low day where we just get you know low level changes to muscles. We can do isolation work alongside that. If we've got light weights at home or body weight exercises, we can do those to try and push a bit of muscle growth as well. But they're very, very easy to manipulate into this high day, low day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think high day, low day just works so well. And it's something we've, we've spoken about, you know, a lot before. So um, so just to just to confirm to the, the listeners, um, on those high days, you'd be looking at a lot of your isometric work. You'd be looking at jumps. You'd be looking at sprints. And on your low day, you'd be looking at, like, say, your, your press ups, your squats, your, you know, I don't want to say uh, bodybuilding work, but your kind of accessory type type work. Exactly that. So, like, um, you know, the, the high days, it's, when we talk about high and low, we talk about the 
the stimulus or the cost to the nervous system in particular. Um, so like if we're doing if we're doing isometric work, it's four to six seconds of really, really hard push or pull as hard as you possibly can against that fixed resistance. So you might be in a deadlift position with the towel under your feet and you're trying to rip the towel in half. You can do that in a split squat position, Bulgarian split squat position. You can wrap a towel behind your back and almost push like you're doing a bench press. Um, and, and like partner resistance exercise is great for this as well. Like if you go down to the bottom of a press up position and have someone just put weight in between your shoulder blades and you push as hard as you can, you physically can't move. That's hard. Like if you're doing that once, twice a week, you're not going to be losing a huge amount off your bench press provided, you know, this doesn't go a huge amount of time. They're, they're pretty good stimulus. Um, Some of us haven't got so the high, bench press anyway, but. Uh... Well, they, yeah, the long, the long arms. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of high cost to the nervous system and, and high stimulus. Um, so that is like max velocity running or like really, really hard sprint starts. That is jumps for like maximal distance or you need traditional like shock method plyometrics where you're dropping off a box. So you've got big, big, big landing to absorb and then a big, big, big force to give. Um, you know, throw in, if you've got a medicine ball, if you've got a heavy kettlebell or something, if you're outside on grass, if you can throw those over your head, if you can throw them up in, in the air, if you can throw them straight down the floor, like these big intense actions. Uh, and then, yeah, the low day is, is isolation exercises. It's kind of more like your, your hypertrophy work, um, like sets of eight to 12, um, single muscle group, single joint actions, that kind of stuff. And then like low intensity, long duration, steady state conditioning work. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, that was going to lead me on to the next point. I mean, in terms of the, the conditioning side of things, obviously off season, um, you know, there's a question of off feet versus on feet. Um, you know, also the question of, you know, do I want to be building an aerobic base now? Do I want to be doing lots of sprint work, et cetera, et cetera. What are, what are your thoughts in regards to that? So like, um, I, I think with a lot, typically in preseason, you've got this kind of, if, if we take a step back, anytime you're developing a training program for any sport, obviously, as, as you, as you know, you kind of look at what the sport entails and you say, well, okay, this is what I need to build towards. Like, this is what I need to be able to do, which is sprint repeatedly, be able to maintain high output for 80 minutes. You know, I need to have a good level of strength and muscle mass uh, and speed so that I can accelerate hard into contact and I can break tackles or I'm fast enough and agile enough. I'm strong enough relative to my own body weight. I can move my body weight laterally quickly and I can evade tackles. Um, to be able to build up to doing these, you know, lots of sprinting actions, lots of accelerations, lots of, you know, you, you can't just start off day one of preseason and say, right, we're going to do loads of sprints, we're going to do loads of heavy contacts. You build up intensity and you build up volume appropriately over time. That's 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 what you would do with any sport, obviously. Um, so at this point, like it's worth really building the engine by doing a, a more volume and um, more kind of steady state work running slower but running a lot further so you're building the aerobic base you're building tolerance in the tissue so that when in four six eight weeks time you have to sprint more or you know you start building up the sprint work and um, you've got the capacity and you've got the ability to tolerate that um you know you, we should still definitely be getting sprints and jumps in as we've spoken about but if you're someone who's essentially had like four or six weeks off or you, you stop playing and you stop training when the when the lockdown started, like your sprint work and your jump work might be tiny, tiny amounts of work for now. You might be doing one or two sprints every five days and you're going to progressively build that up over the next eight weeks. And um, we should still be doing that to get that kind of high day, low day structure. But um, where you're going to be less... Um, worried about volume and where you're going to be able to give yourself a big stimulus and where you're going to be able to really spend time training is this kind of lower level extensive work because it's there's, there's not as much injury risk associated with it and they're the kind of things that we need to be working on now so that we can push on further down the line yeah absolutely i think it's it's really interesting in terms of you know i think a lot of people are uh seeing these online challenges and things like that and they're going out and trying to run 5k 10k but you know, obviously, as you say, it's important to you know, just gradually, gradually build that that base, but still in the high days, obviously keeping that that high intensity work in there. But you know, it's just a case of managing managing the volume, isn't it? So exactly that, and like the the kind of the sorry, go on. I was, I was going to say just that that five that five k run, um, the five k run kind of challenge that you're seeing people do all over Instagram and Facebook now. Like people are able to just kind of go out there every single day and do that. Uh, and, and I'm seeing lots of people that are doing it. 
But they're also the people that if they were to do a 5K every day on the bounce for five days, when they then come to do a sprint training session tomorrow, they never hit top speed yeah. because they've just flogged themselves at that kind of mid-level kind of death zone in the middle, so to speak, for the whole week. So when they come to do their big high-intensity days, they're too tired to actually do it. Yeah. The only way you ever get faster is by running fast and doing it regularly. And if you're too tired to ever actually hit your top speed, that top speed never moves up. Define the um, so like it, it sounds really counterintuitive. It, it sounds really counterintuitive, but sometimes like even if you're going to run a five k and you can do it in twenty five minutes, great. But you're probably actually better served doing it in thirty or thirty five minutes or even forty minutes yeah. because you're you're going low enough that you're getting some adaptations in your connective tissue. Like your body is learning to tolerate load. But actually, it probably serves more as a recovery tool and a general base building tool than running that hard 5K. Does you're in the same distance, you've run slower, but it's probably actually better for you rather than your because age. the subsequent training sessions over the next one, two, three, four, five days, yeah. you can actually get the most out of them from. So the cumulative effect is much better rather than your intensity just being like this throughout the week. You know, sort of very, very moderate on the high days. Make make them high. Make sure you're recovered enough from the the, the lower days. That you can, mm-hmm. you know, that that's one of my biggest bugbears in in watching uh, athletes and strength conditioning coaches is, is getting guys doing sprint work when they're fatigued, and it's you know yeah. it, it completely defies the the purpose of of actually doing speed work. Like I say, you you know the only way to get faster is to run fast, and if you're tired and fatigued, you, you know neurally you're not firing, you know there's you're just not running any speed, and therefore the training becomes pretty pointless. Um, so yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's, as you say, very important to, you know, to differentiate and get those, those higher days, those lower days. And like I say on the lower days, just maybe just chill out a little bit more, just go at a slightly, you know, a slightly steadier, steadier pace. Don't worry so much about hitting the times, um, just getting, getting the work in there, just getting the contacts in there, uh, building up the tissue tolerance. And then on the high days is right. Okay. I'm, I'm fresh and recovered let's go you know let, let's actually make some mm-hmm. let's, let's actually create you know enough speed enough stress to to cause an adaptation exactly that and like um you know you see it, a lot of the kind of research you have a like classical research you have is based more on like olympic sports or like endurance events and track athletes but you'll see you know some of the best marathon runners of all time or some of the best rowers of all time in the olympics when you look at there's so their training of like a full four-year olympic cycle and there's such a small percentage of the work that is done at a high level you know if you're if a track athlete is trying to run a marathon at five minute mile pace they're quite often doing the bulk of their training at like six and a half minute pace and it's way 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 slower than they can do um but you know they they accumulate a lot of training at a sub-maximal level and then when they're going to run fast they run fast yeah um that's the same with those well, times are way off but like uh, olympic athletes never running at six and a half many miles but you know but it's it's yeah, <laughs> like it's, they're they're you know they're, they're accumulating a lot of work that's 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 in some respects easy um yeah. and 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 again i think that's what people don't tend to i think naturally rugby players will gravitate towards just wanting to work hard and just blow the doors off whenever they train. But, I think, um, I think they're working but it's understanding kind of why you need to sometimes rein yourself in so that when you you want to put your foot on the throttle, you go. Yeah, they think they're working hard, but they're not. Because they're, they, they're so used to being uh, fatigued in such a high level of fatigue that, you know, they're going in and doing the gym sessions and, you know, the, the field sessions and they, they think they're working at a high level. But they're so fatigued from constantly being at that kind of moderate to high level. Does, does that make sense? So they're, you know, the actual, you know, they're not actually performing at any sort of high intensity um and i think with uh you know you see that with weightlifters mm-hmm. and powerlifters as well a good level is you know a majority of the training is you know we're saying you know we're saying powerlifting you know the strengths built at 80 to 90 percent you know 90 percent um plus is a good demonstration of strength but actually building strength you know is, is accumulating you know skill volume mm-hmm. etc 80 to 90 percent it's, it's the same with weightlifters as well you know, you're not you're not working at you know sort of maxes every single day, um, and uh, yeah, I think as you say that sort of carries over to, to to rugby as well. Yeah, absolutely. That and it's 
and it, it's like I say, it's it's not as tangible. I don't think, especially like again, if you're working at the the lower levels, you very rarely will get speed gates out and actually test how fast you are over thirty meters or test what your maximum sprint speed is because you just don't have that GPS technology sure. available to you. you. Don't have speed gates available to you. Um, so the most immediate kind of metric, so the most immediate metric you have to measure the quality of your training is how tired you are afterwards. Oh, that's kind of how that's kind of how a lot of players I know perceive things. So oh, I'm absolutely knackered. I was doing loads and loads of really hard running. That must have been a really good session. Whereas actually, if you turn around and say to you, right, okay, well, that was a speed session. You were meant to hit top speed five times for like a hundred meters total, um, which is a really small amount of very, very, very fast running. And they'll say, oh, I don't feel tired. Let's do more. Let's do more. and actually all they do then is just get more and more tired. And else oh, that session got better and better as it did more. But actually the speed they were hitting got lower and lower and lower. I think it's uh, one of the hardest things to do uh, with 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 a field based athlete is doing that speed work, emphasizing the importance of the absolute highest intent of running as fast as you can mm-hmm. and, and taking a three to five minute recovery <laughs> before you go again. Mm-hmm. you know and the athletes want it you know they finish a sprint and they're taking a exactly like, go, you know i want to go again i want to go again and it's like well how, you know what what is the the specific modality that we're trying to train here you know and if it, and if it is speed then obviously we need you know we need yeah, the, exactly the replenishment of atp we need to you know to, to, to get the benefit from that that session um and uh, that seems to carry over to the aerobic work with the running, with the 5K stuff that we just spoke about. Um, I think that carries over to, you know, to, to gym-based sessions as well, whether, whether there's training strength, whether there's sort of doing more hypertrophy session or whatever, is, you know, just uh, the inability to train smart as, a part, uh, as opposed to hard all, all of the time. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think um, I think we've we've covered a lot there. I mean, in terms of just to just to conclude, um, if we've got sort of you know five five minutes now, or you know just a few minutes mm-hmm. with a rugby player, you talk to them, you know, right now, right, what we do, what we doing for the next couple of months, and what's a, what what does an average you know week look like? We've talked about obviously high, low, just a very quick. Uh, sort of conclusion of that yeah so like your your high days um always start off with the fastest velocity movement so you start off sprints um that like you know your, your morning session might be sprinting you can then progress that into jumps into throws um, and then finishing off the day with if you're going to be doing kind of strength based training um, you either have you know these big maximal isometrics or like big overloaded eccentrics. Um, you know things like Nordic, things like partner assisted eccentric chin ups or eccentric press ups, um, where you're kind of being forced down and muscles are lengthening under huge amounts of tension. That that's your kind of strength training for for your high days. If you haven't got access to weights, if you do have weights, you know it's still your big heavy squats, it's still your big heavy benches, heavy chin ups low volume, not a lot of reps, um, and shifting big tin, basically. Your low days then, um, you know, long hold isometrics. Um, so 30 seconds plus are going to be a really, really good preventative tool for injuries. Um, you know, so doing these in split squat positions, doing long hold hamstring bridges, long hold kind of Copenhagen planks where you're, you're, you're loading the groin and, and the adductors. Um, you might be skipping on these days. You might be doing long steady state runs with a really nice low heart rate, you know, kind of 60 percent. Um, uh, and this is these are the days where you mobilize. You might do some bodybuilding type stuff, body weight exercises, um, you know, light, lighter weights and more reps, eight. 12, 15 reps, um, ideally kind of isolation based stuff. Um, so, so we're alternating like this throughout the week, um, sprinting fast twice a week, um, tempo running, skipping, um, steady state work. We can do three, four times a week on all these low days. Um, but you're looking to get two, potentially three high days in throughout the week, more likely three, 
Um, I think if you start pushing into four high days, you're pushing your luck a little bit, um, especially if you're trying to run at top, top speeds. Um, but, but the big thing to, to take home is that like you can still train effectively during this period, even if you have access to very, very limited weights or very limited barbells or, or gym equipment, you know, with a minimal amount of stuff, you can get really, really good quality stuff, exercise done. Um, if you're smart about how you structure things and if you're smart about how you put things together. Um, the the biggest thing that you can do and the biggest thing that you're going to achieve in this situation if you don't have much in the way of kit is you're going to come back and you're going to be in the best position possible to tolerate what is being asked of you uh, from training, from technical coaches, from from what is effectively going to be the preseason. Um, at, at best, um, you know, you're going to go in and you're going to have maintained a lot of your physical quality and you're actually going to be streets ahead of most of the players that haven't and that have dropped off a cliff and they've been doing these really inefficient workouts that don't really give them too much. Um, so at, 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 at the least, you're going to be able to, to be to be fit and robust. At the best, you're going to be well ahead of the competition. So um, it's an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the way to look at it, isn't it? Is, is an opportunity and to perhaps you know, think of these kind of things that players might not have thought of before, like you say, with your isometrics, with building that robustness, you know, in, in time for the, what might be a short preseason um, and, and, for, and for the games to, to come. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting times. It's going to be interesting to see who, who comes out on top and who, you know, who, who does well. Yeah. And I think it, in each, in each squad, you're going to see the guys, you, you'll definitely be able to see the guys who have been uh, been doing the best they can with what they've got, you know, against the guys who have maybe thought, well, you know, sorry, I'm not going to, you know, I've, I've got no kit, I've got no gym, so what's the point? I think you'll see yeah. it between the Come two. Come on, mate. <laughs> Come on, mate. Stone heavier, dodgy haircut. Yeah. Oh, there'll be some... Lid. Just generally, generally not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Max. Uh, cool. Brilliant. I think uh, we'll, we'll round up there unless there's anything you wanted to, to add. No, no, no. Like I said, just a big thing, like um, anyone listening, like if this kind of feels like it applies to you or if you want any more advice, obviously we're both going to be on the social media. Obviously you're at MSC Performance. I'm at MH underscore strength, strength coach or uh, at MSC Injury Clinic. Um, but yeah, like don't be afraid. Get in touch. Ask any questions. Uh, slide into the DMs and, and and see what see what questions you've got. Absolutely, yeah. As Max says, guys, just uh, yeah, keep in touch on the social media channels and uh, you know any questions, um, contact us via our Instagram pages, uh, Facebook, uh, and email addresses uh, too. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for tuning in and uh, thank you to Max for for joining us and um, good luck with uh, you know with the off season, the pre season, and. Uh, all the best, guys. Thanks for tuning in.